In February, I reported that McKenna Mac Sinise, the beloved son of actor and philanthropist Gary Sinise, died on January 5th at the age of 33 after battling a rare form of cancer. Mac was a musician, a composer. For a time, he played drums in his father's Lieutenant Dan band. I sat down with Gary Sinise and Mac's dear friend and musical collaborator, Oliver Schnee, in Nashville recently to talk about Mac's struggle and his final wish to create an album of his unfinished musical compositions. It is a story of healing, hope, and faith with a lesson for all of us. Mac Sinise was diagnosed with cancer in 2018, sparking a struggle and a final work he could not foresee at the time. Here's my interview with Gary Sinise. Tell me what Mac was like before the cancer diagnosis. He was just, a, you know, Mac uh, is a, he's just full spirit, kind of a little bit shy, but a very, very smart, deep thinker. Um, really, really was a, the kind of person who um, you couldn't just sort of tell him something and have him sort of accept it and just kind of go on. He would, he would want to know, well, why you think, why do you think that? You were telling me the other day about 2017, when Mac has a reversion to faith, to his Catholic faith. So he went to USC. He graduated from USC, um, uh, Thornton School of Music. Mm -hmm. um, uh, studied songwriting, composition. He was a drummer, you know, really, really great drummer. Then he graduates and he goes off and starts the music thing. And he was in the music thing. And, uh, you know, at one point he, he just was not as happy as he wanted to be. He just found himself kind of at a loss. Uh, so he came home uh, for a while to kind of regroup. And one of the things that uh, we introduced him to, to a friend of ours who had been kind of a counselor or therapist, uh, Catholic, um, really good Catholic sort of thinker, and a lot of things opened up for Mac uh, at that point. He really started, uh, started f sort of finding out that he was a very faithful, spiritual guy, and I think he was reinvestigating a lot of that and and mm -hmm. really finding out that that was a big important part of his life I mean it was Bishop Robert Barron uh, who confirmed Mac into the church in 2017 uh, this was probably 14 months before he was diagnosed with cancer uh, and, and, the, and the church and his faith and uh, you know what he was seeking and what he was discovering and how he was analyzing and the people he was meeting, um, that w became such a big part of his life. Tell me about this cancer, Gary. How did it first m manifest and what was it? It's a very rare strain of cancer. Yeah. So uh, Mac was having a lot of trouble uh, with pain in his tailbone mm. for not, not just a short period of time, uh, over a number of years. Wow. And we thought, um, you know, he had, he had seen a doctor. Uh, the doctor said, well, it's probably a bruise. You know, you got a bruise on your tailbone. At one point, he was on a tour with a band over in, in uh, Europe. And they went for a bike ride. And he jammed on the brakes mm -hmm. a little too hard. And his tailbone went into the seat. And he had just a lot of pain. So he thought maybe this pain that, we, that he's having later on was related to something he did with the bike. Right. But it just got worse and worse. I mean, he was just having tr trouble sleeping. Finally, Moira, my wife, had had uh, s uh, some spine surgery. Mm -hmm. And so we sent Mac to his, uh, her spine surgeon. Mm. And he put him in the CT scanner and called me up uh, and said, there's a tumor. And he showed us this orange-sized tumor that was on Mac's tailbone. And he said, I think this is something called a chordoma. It's a very, very rare cancer. You know, maybe 300 people per year in the U.S. Mm. are diagnosed with this cancer. Quite often, they can take out the initial tumor and they can cure it. It's gone. They, they get everything and it's gone. But about 30% of those 300 cases, the cancer comes back. And that's what happened with Mac. How did it change him? Did it change him? 
surgery was scheduled for September of 2018. And uh, we went to UCLA in uh, Santa Monica and uh, the tumor was removed. And uh, because of the way the tumor was on the sacrum and the nerves and everything like that, certain things were, were um, you know, they had, and in order to get it, they had to cut certain nerves. And mm. so that altered his lifestyle a bit but he was still able to walk, you know, he went to rehab. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, about eight months later, we found out that the cancer came back Oof. and it was starting to spread. When did Mac lose the use of one side of his body? I mean, he couldn't, he could no longer drum his great love in music. Yeah, I, I think in 2019, you know, he was now, he was now, uh, we had to deal with chemo and radiation he had to start to step away from the foundation. Yeah. He was still able to walk, mm -hmm. but he, had, he, was, he was just, Too you much. know, he was in the, in the battle. And then we found out right around Christmas time in 2019 that there was more tumor on his neck. So he's gonna have to go in early 2020 and uh, get another surgery on his neck to remove tumor here. He was in there for two months. This is 2020, two now months. remember, two months. But then he had to have another spine surgery. Mm. So we had to go back in June and he was in the hospital then for four months. Mm. So six out of the first eight months of 2020, he was in the hospital and it was that one that the, the nature of removing the tumor from the yeah. spine did a lot of damage to his right side. Mm. And he really couldn't move his right leg very well and he couldn't use the fingers on his right hand. So Gary, after all of these surgeries and the chemo and the radiation, I can see why he sort of gave up on music for a time. Yeah, well, yeah, 2020 was a, was a big year because he was in the hospital most of the year. By the time he got home, he was now in a wheelchair. He lost all feeling from here down. So he couldn't walk anymore. Uh, so music was, you know, he wasn't even thinking about music at that point. He's just, he's fighting cancer. He's doing multiple different drugs that they're trying on him to fight the cancer. There are no drugs for chordoma. Mac's friend, Oliver Schnee, a fellow musician, had lost touch with his college buddy. I kind of took a step back um, and wanted to give him some space and uh, I would still send messages of love and support from afar, whether it be a voicemail or a text or an email. But he wasn't responding. Wouldn't get a response. And finally, uh, earlier last year, I found some old photos of Mac and I at Disneyland from, I don't know, we were 19, 20 years old, just children. And I thought, you know, what the heck, I'm gonna send it to him. And even if he doesn't respond, maybe he'll see him and it'll give him a moment of joy, of nostalgia. And to my surprise, he responded right away. And I went, oh my God, hey, you're alive. You wanna come to my studio? You wanna meet halfway? Cause we were living on opposite sides of the town. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, I guess you don't know, but you know, I'm sadly paralyzed right now. And I went, oh, I did not know that. I'll come to you. Wow. And so I drove to his house. Oh man, my heart broke. When I saw Mac, nothing could have really prepared me mm -hmm. for just how heavy it was. Yeah. Uh, especially knowing that he was a drummer and now being paralyzed, he couldn't even play his instrument as a form of catharsis. Mm. And so that really hit hard. But what I did notice was that his attitude and his spirit was still incredibly upbeat. Oh. Um, and it was very admirable and, and inspiring to witness. And while we were there, I asked him, Mac, you know, obviously you can't play drums anymore. Um, but what is your relationship with music like these days? Are you listening to music? Is it too painful? And he, he lit up. I told him kind of that I was uh, trying to write music and stuff again. And, um, I had stopped, you know, quite, quite a bit, you know, just been focusing on trying to get my health back in, into shape and just to fight this battle of cancer. Um, and in the process, um, you know, writing music has been a, a huge therapy for me. And you say, I found this old piece of music that I had started to write back when I was in college. I never finished it, but I really want to, and I want to do it with a full orchestra. 
I want to do it before I reach my sunset. And I said, oh, wow, okay. Um, can I hear it? And so he sent it to me, and I called back the next day, and I said, Mac, this is really good. And is that how he put it to you? You mentioned a moment ago, he said, we, we want to get this done before my sunset. The way he said uh, was even a little uh, more blunt. I asked him, so what sort of timeline are you on? And he said, well, preferably sooner than later. I'd like to have it done before I go. And I went, oh, wow. Oh boy. Well, that's, that's something I never needed to hear. I mean, mm. but totally got the message across. Totally, the urgency I mean, of this. Yeah, it's the true definition of deadline, you know? Mm. And it was just like, okay, let's get this done. Hi, everyone. And then he starts finishing works he had begun? Is he writing new things? What's happening? I'm discovering a lot of things on his phone and on his iPad now that I didn't know he was dabbling with. So we'd go to bed and he was up and we had in-home nursing care mm -hmm. that was there with him. But he'd be in there doing all kinds of things. He's listening to podcasts, you know, reading his Bible uh, mm -hmm. or writing music, <laughs> we, we discovered. So he was playing with some different ideas. How was he writing these pieces? Yeah, that's a great question. I was curious how he was doing that too. And then when one of the days I was at his house, he's in his hospital bed and he's got a little stylus Velcroed to his hand with an iPad and he's tapping in individual notes one by one. And, and I mean, I, it's just the beauty of what technology can do, um, mm. but also the beauty of his patience because mm that takes a lot longer than being able to just do 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 right or even with a pencil and paper you know right right because his mind might be going 100 miles an hour but his body's not able to do that and so mm. he was always very excited like hey check this out i wrote eight bars of this new melody do you think this works huh. and i'd listen to it and i say yeah it was amazing watching him work and write because it was like un unlike any other project I've been a part of. Yeah, exactly. He's still doing chemo. He's still having nausea and side effects from the chemo. He's still having issues with the cancer. But all the while, he's working on this piece with Oliver. And, you know, he, he said to me at a certain point, Dad, Dad, we're going to, you know, we're going to record this. Let's, let's, you know, what do you think? And should I, should I pay for it? And I said, well, you have the money, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you should definitely do it. And so he really started gearing up for the fact that he could finance his own mm -hmm. recording. This is Arctic Circles. Arctic Circles. Oliver started in on the arrangement, and then by July, they were in the studio. Think, you're in the Arctic, it's white, the wind is wh whistling by, and as soon as you speak your, your, your word, the wind takes it and it's gone. Then let's give it a shot. Have some fun, guys. It was this. It was this wild mixture of his body failing, but mentally, creatively, spiritually, he's still going, and there's still a lot of music inside him that wants to come out and that needs to come out. You, you watch it and he is, I mean, he is beaming in the video. It's like he's, I mean, Oliver said it, it, it was like the old Mac was back. Yeah. It was incredible to watch Oliver back there and Mac's like going through the score and he says, in bar 36, can you go and try this thing, make it shorter and blah, blah, blah. And he's working. He's sitting there working. He's not just, he's working with Oliver to make the piece come to life the way they had it envisioned. It was beautiful, and I, Raymond, I hadn't heard any of it, really, until that day.
Penguin Dance is a little different. He wrote that after he wrote our, after they recorded Arctic Circles. He wrote Penguin Dance. He's sitting there watching penguins in nature shows on his television, and just was inspired to wrote that, yeah. write that song. He was working on all kinds of things, you know, that we didn't know, and he was thinking all kinds of things. I did notice as we got started that there was an uptick in his energy level and his attitude. Mm -hmm. um, and I, everyone from his, his, his housekeepers to his parents to his sisters to his brother-in-law, they all said the same thing, which is since he started working on this project, he is back to being Mac. He's mm -hmm. smiling again. He's waking up looking forward to the day ahead of him. He rediscovered his purpose. Yeah, and then he calls and he goes, hey man, I need to finish this. And I went, what do you mean? He's like, this project is keeping me going. It's keeping me alive. It's, I'm rediscovering my purpose. So can we do a whole album? I said, let's do it, man. That's when they made the decision to make an album of music Aww. and not just a couple of pieces, mm -hmm. but make a whole record of pieces, 10, ten different pieces. Um, and he wanted that day in the studio with my band. And so the types of music he picked were things that he could play harmonica on. He very typical Mac, very gentle soul, very humble, very soft-spoken, very politely asked, what do you think about adding strings to this? Hmm. And it was an old tune called Shenandoah. Yeah. And I said, well, that's a great idea. Also, I think it's vital and very important that you are performing on this because you're not able to perform on Arctic Circles. And he said, that's a great idea. I want that to be a gift to my family, you know, when the day comes. And once again, him always thinking of others and thinking of giving back to his family. his breathing, he could only really play up to 15, 20 seconds at a time. Um, and his timing was still brilliant being a drummer. That internal clock never left him. Um, and, and I'm so glad that his mom recommended that he pick up the harmonica because it was the one way that he could find an outlet for this music that was inside. And Mac, the day before, again, very gentle soul, calls me and goes, I want the experience of recording with my dad one last time, and I went, say no more. We'll set you up in a booth, we'll give you direct eye line to Gary. And suddenly he's playing full takes. Yeah, yeah, that was one of the most powerful and incredible moments th through the whole last 12 months was being in Blackbird Studio D. Something kicked into high gear, adrenaline or what, but he was able to play the song from top to bottom when he couldn't play 15 seconds a few weeks ago. He was able to play the whole song top to bottom. So we play Red River Valley uh, on his record with Mac playing harmonica. My singer Jeff Vazane sings the lyrics. I'm playing bass. That was a, that was a great moment. Just seeing him in the studio with his dad playing like they used to you know, and uh, it was really beautiful and really inspiring. You used a phrase to describe Mac throughout this whole recording period. What was the line you mentioned to me? Uh, spitting out the venom. I don't know where I heard it a few years ago, but it always stuck with me and it basically meaning whatever venom inside, whether it's emotional turmoil, physical mm -hmm. failure, mental health, whatever it is, spitting that venom out and choosing to create something beautiful with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mac did that in spades. And, and as someone who is obsessed with finding meaning in life, mm -hmm. this was so meaningful to not only witness, but to be a part of. What's the lesson here? What's the lesson here for the other people is who are suffering the same way? Mac wanted to keep living you know, in spite of the damage that was being done to him by the disease. 
and he every moment that he had that he was feeling good he was taking advantage of it that's what we talked about a lot you know because sometimes mac would start to think down the road a little bit too much and i said mac it's you know well what if i don't feel good you know when we want to go over here or when we want to do something mm -hmm. and i said you know we we discussed together you know the fact that he should not spend time thinking about that you know not spend time thinking about what might be down the road or what and he got really good at that at at thinking for today and you know living for for today and Those days in the studio, you can see, you know, he was alive in the studio when, when you see those videos and he was enjoying those, those moments. His faith really sustained him a lot and, and if you look in his Bible and you look in some of the books that he was mm -hmm. reading, um, he was constantly un underlining things that really jumped out to him and meant something mm. to him. And, and when I sit and read some of the things, uh, you know, it's like Mac just telling me stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like messages, you know. What do you think he's telling you now? Keep going, Dad. <laughs> Keep going, stop, stop crying. <laughs> no, you're, you're doing it. It's an amazing tribute to him, and his, it's his spirit that you hear in those recordings. And when you sent me that first clip, I think it was Arctic Circles that you first sent Yeah, me. yeah, and Shenandoah. I remember it was at the end of the year, and I'm reporting all the normal crap and trash we have to report day in and day out, political and otherwise, and I thought, this is the end of the year. You got to give people some hope, and when I heard this music and the story, I said, we got to tell this somehow, and I know there was some hesitation, and we went back and forth, and you agreed to come on when I was hosting at Fox. This is the moment when you and Mac and the family first heard his composition, which took many years to write, come to life. I'm so glad Mac saw that. What was his reaction to your appearance and sharing his music with people really for the first time? What, what I feel now is that, you know, and especially after seeing how Mac lit up mm. when I did go on your show, and you featured his music, and I was in the satellite truck in our driveway doing the interview live with you right. while he was in the house watching. watching it, and then coming in and seeing the look on his face and how proud he was and, and smiling. And the next day I had to take him to the hospital. What happened? And uh, you know, he was having trouble breathing, and you sent me the clip of the interview mm -hmm. and he was in the hospital showing that clip to while he was still able to showing the clip to the nurses and the doctors and then they would go to his YouTube channel and look at the music the come back thing. in crying and tell him how great it was and then he'd light up and smile he was um, he was at peace at the end and he was happy at the end with what he'd accomplished and he felt very I think he he felt you know he he felt good he had completed his mission this great work that it was inside of him that he didn't get out before I mean yeah. w when I listen to it I hear that I hear hope hard won hope at times but hope Let's take it back to like a year ago. There, there were certain parts of, of this whole journey that I, I didn't think I was going to survive through. And maybe if I just get in touch with a friend of mine and, and you know, suggest like maybe we could, you know, do an album and, and you know, that, that, that was just way far off my 
uh, radar. You know, didn't think that was possible at all. And you know, here I am. You know, two two months later, or whatever it is, and the the ideas that were in my head are now realized into reality. So it, it just goes to show me that like I have to, you know, just um, keep, um, you know, keep moving forward. With Mac, you know, he, he, I think he, at a certain point he accepted what was happening. In fact, I know because uh, since, since then, as I said, I went into his phone and I went into his iPad and I found things that he wrote, mm. you know, like years ago when he thought maybe he wasn't going to make it or it wasn't going to be around very long. Yeah. And he wrote things in preparation for, for that time where we would miss him and where he wanted us to know certain things that we should not be concerned about, you know, and, and that he had a good life. Yeah. And that he was, uh, he, you know, he was accepting of it. And then toward the end where he just said, I'm going to live as much as I possibly can for, for whatever time I have. And we don't know how long that's going to be. And what do I want to do? I want to complete some things that I never completed before. And, and he did that. And that's, that's a really positive, inspiring uh, story of, of perseverance through real obstacle and real challenge no matter what don't give up fight on you know live to the fullest as, as long as you can Gary I have to tell you I I mean Moira had her own health battles while Mac is having his I mean how, how did you how did you balance that deal with it I mean these are two of the people you love most in the world and they're both these are grave health challenges they're both facing at the same time yeah we found we found out Moira had cancer uh, two months before we found out Mac had cancer and she had had multiple spine surgeries and hip surgeries and then along comes Mac and he's got a big tumor and he's got a cancer and, and we've got a fight it has to try you though try your faith there were there there were were there times where I just kind of fell down on the on the stairs and yeah 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 there was some there was some very challenging moments where I just I didn't know uh, I I think most challenging was kind of not knowing what to do you know I, I'm I'm running out of options I'm running out of ideas to help both of them, you know, um, yet you get over that pretty quickly and then you make the next phone call, yeah. you know, and call the next doctor, or try to figure out, you know, the, ne the next step. And mm -hmm. I didn't want Mac thinking about his cancer right. problem all the time and, right. you know, what doctors to call and, you know, who to yeah. talk to about this and that. I, I tried to take that as much as I could. Well, that's real faith, the act, to just keep going. Yeah. That's real faith. You know, and I've learned a lot, uh, Raymond, over the years from a lot of very, very broken families, you mm. know, that we deal with at the Gary Sinise Foundation. We're dealing with a lot of, you know, difficult things, you know, wounded folks and, you know, broken families that have lost loved ones, uh, you know, in military service. And I've been around that a lot. I've been in the hospitals a lot. Uh, you know, I, I felt like when when a lot of this stuff started happening, I was, I was sort of somewhat prepared for it because of the amount of time I'd spent with other families that right. were going through the same thing and watching them kind of power through and Punch just back and continue on. do what they got to do. So that gave me a lot of strength and mm. courage and, you know, in, in, inspiration to just face it. And I, you know, prayed, prayed on it. And, you know, we, we have a, a strong family. Our yeah. daughters are amazing. Their husbands are amazing. Uh, my wife is amazing the way she's dealt with one physical problem after, after another. And our faith has been, been good to us and strong, to us, uh, strong for us. Animated by that faith, the Sinise family are honoring Mac 
with the release of his first album. And he calls it Resurrection and Revival because everything, all his film composition stuff, with the exception of Penguin Dance, is kind of, he's kind of bringing it back to life. Mm -hmm. And then he's got older songs uh -huh. that are on there, like Red River Valley and Amazing Grace and yeah. stuff that he wants to sort of revive and bring back to new life. Mm. And he calls it Resurrection and Revival. He designed the album cover. He designed the back. Uh, you know, he wanted, he wanted to print. He said, Dad, what do you think if I just print mm -hmm. up a hundred vinyls to give, so we can give them to people. And if we sell any, we can, uh, the, the, the proceeds can go to the Gary Sinise Foundation. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, that's a great idea, Mac, do it. Mac, who was the one who was unhealthy, is the one giving all of us the good medicine, you know, and still to this day, he, he, we find little, little gems of pieces of music that he, you know, started to write and then put on the shelf and and then started to write something else. Kind of angled looking this way so we can get a shot of you playing and the players are behind, you know? Okay. Yeah, and Oliver did a tremendous job. Uh, they were a great team and, uh, you know, it was God at work there that just out of the blue, you know, they reconnect after all those years and then they go to work together and create this music. It was beautiful. Spectacular. Gary Sinise, you're a good dad. Thank you. That's great. Resurrection and Revival, music by Max Sinise, is available in a special vinyl-only edition from the Gary Sinise Foundation website. Visit store.garysiniseFoundation.com to place an order. Per Max Sinise's wishes, all proceeds from the vinyl edition of Resurrection and Revival will go to benefit the work of the Gary Sinise Foundation. We will let you know when it becomes available on CD or on the streaming platforms. You can also contribute to Teen Mac, his fundraising campaign at the Cordoma Foundation. Visit impact.cordomafoundation.org forward slash Team Mac. What a great soul. May Mac Sinise rest in peace and keep our friends, the Sinise family, in your prayers.